Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar series brought to you by the World Bank uh, to Global Practices, Urban and ICT. Uh, today we have a webinar, we're kicking off a new series of webinar, which is follow up to our previous Smart Cities series, which was uh, presented in 2014. And this will continue on the same theme. So basically what we are doing is to facilitate dialogues on how cities can make a use of data and technology to improve the city planning, management and service delivery by engaging citizens and other stakeholders in a joint innovation process. The theme today is, is the flagship initiatives that can foster civic innovation within cities. And we are bringing you two, two speakers and two practical examples from city of Amsterdam, namely to launch chief technology office in a city. And from Mexico City, where we are bringing you the example of uh, Laboratorio de Ciudad. And both these uh, examples really show how cities can foster civic innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and in general, rethinking about city spaces through implementing specific strategies, thematic programs, and flagship projects. Our speakers today are Katalin Gallias, and she is an Open Innovation Manager at the CTO office in the city of Amsterdam. Currently, Katalin is responsible for the Open Innovation Business Development, is matching local and EU funds for accelerating cutting-edge innovation process in the city of Amsterdam. And all this, of course, is embracing very much on open database solutions, crowdsourcing platforms, and citizen-centric open source mobile apps development. Our second speaker is uh, Ms. Gabriela gomez Mon, and she is a director at the Laboratorio para la Ciudad at Mexico City. Gabriela directs Laboratorio, and Laboratorio itself is a new creative think tank and experimental space established uh, by the public authorities in the city. Laboratorio is also a place to reflect on all things going on in the city and ponder what kind of a social scripts and ur urban futures are possible and how to create examples of these. Gabriela herself is a multilingual writer, visual artist, documentary film director, cultural advisor, and arts curator. She has founded several projects, and uh, she is also City 2.0 TED Prize Grant of RD, TED Senior Fellow, Yale World Fellow, and Fabricia S. Ex Alumnus. So with these words, I, I would like to open open the webinar, the first webinar series uh, for the speakers. And before we go there, I would just like to remind you that we are also recording this webinar, and this can be accessed afterwards in 24 hours to our website. So our first speaker is uh, Katalin. So uh, Katalin, please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Hilary, so much. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and uh, thank you so much for this kind invitation. Um, as Hilary already mentioned, um, I am working in Amsterdam in the Chief Technology Office, and today I would like to um, I would like to explain you how this innovation incubator has been set up in Amsterdam what are our core um, um, business area, and how we accelerate innovation within the city hall. Um, so let me just first uh, explain, uh, just explaining first um, how my presentation today is built. Uh, so first I would like to explain a little bit the background of Amsterdam, uh, what are the uh, current circumstances we are operating, what are the current challenges, 
what are the uh, actually the complex urban uh, challenges that um, the city of Amsterdam is combating and try to sort it out and then I will uh, present you how the CTO office is mitigating these uh, challenges and how we try to connect uh, enterprises, living labs to in, in, with the city hall and how we actually um, mounted a new governance model within the city hall. And then at the end of my presentation, I will also showcase you some um, iconic projects from the CTO office. So the background of Amsterdam, um, if you know, uh, we are a medieval city with a very rich um, canal network. Um, and that brings also barriers, barriers for growth, but also we have to stay, monu we have to protect our monument. Um, so that gives a very interesting uh, dynamic in the city. We are very much um, um, like central, uh, cent centrally placed and infrastructurally very well built city. Uh, we have like um, 825,000 inhabitants, um, and um, which is very unique um, that we have uh, 177 nationalities, so highly multicultural, uh, very diverse population. And what is important now, I would like to start my presentation with that we were having, of course, the medieval ages, golden age, and we Dutch um, community is very well known for the trade uh, spirit and um, how they conquered the world and explored um, and um, for the spirit of trading. But nowadays um, we have um, lots of businesses um, um, mounted that are actually making use of connectivity and data. And nowadays the most challenging questions we are facing are uh, how to recapture the value of data, how to build um, locally generated data, locally generated energy, and how to build up a, a community that can use, for example, smart grid, energy that is actually circulating um, and being reused. So what is important to understand that we are moving towards a distributed society that is where the power of network is much more important than being in a very monopolistic city. So Amsterdam still uh, maintains this trade spirit. We would like to collaborate with the different cities, different with the European Commission, of course, with the World Bank. So this distributed structure helps, help, helps us really a lot to accelerate in innovation. We are also part of the city protocols projects um, that is actually mentioning that um, the uh, physical infrastructure of the cities are very important, but uh, beyond the physical infrastructure, there is a new ICT layer appearing, and it's very important to um, to emphasize that we have to have a very good connection, Wi-Fi, uh, and that we have to have objects that can communicate with us. Um, so the most important challenge uh, that uh, my department is facing is that thinking about the future. There are many questions that are not being covered by the traditional divisions of the city hall. So um, we are thinking very much uh, how to accelerate the city, not just in a physical, economic uh, and social sense, but also more like uh, all encompassing uh, inclusion. Um, and that's very important, not just thinking in terms of technology, but m much more about participation. Um, what we try to advocate also in Amsterdam um, to use data technology, digital uh, connection, uh, smart sensors, but also robots. Uh, um, and very often we get questions, we are not used to it, like how to um, actually implement drones that are delivering uh, pizza. And we, we noticed that my department, so this department, the chief technology office, has to be very responsive to this kind of new questions. Um, so just um, to explain you the trends that we are facing now. Um, Amsterdam we can also see as a kind of city of a big desires. Uh, because we want to be attractive for foreign investment, but also for attracting talent. We also would like to be economically very strong and vital city, having um, really um, um, good stock exchange, good trade missions. Uh, but we also incubating a startup um, um, district in the harbor area where we would like to accelerate, we would like incubate approximately 100 new startups yearly with the support of Nelly Cruz. So it's also a very important theme nowadays. 
Then the sharing city, we have more and more platforms emerging that are sharing tools, uh, cars. So the city has to be also responsive that we have these platforms, we have this attitude of, um, to want to share. Um, we also want to be hyper-connected. Um, citizens want to be 24 hours uh, reachable. They want to give feedback for city services. So that's also for policymakers a completely new phenomenon. Uh, we also would like to be digital and data-driven city. We would like to have decision-making uh, that is being based on, um, on smart data and analytics. But we also want to be very much a sustainable and resilient city. For example, all municipality buildings in Amsterdam have to be CO2 neutral in 2015. We also want to be very uh, having a high quality of life and a healthy city where we can actually combine the living and working functionality. Um, we also want to pay lots of attention for citizens. We want to include them in decision making. Uh, so this is a highly ambitious um, city vision. Um, and if you walk through the streets of Amsterdam, you see this kind of density. We have nearly 4,000 people living in one square meter, one a square kilometer. So it's really a, a dense city, and that creates also for policymakers the challenge: how to create a balance, how to make this crowd flow nicely, and you can also find your own space. Um, as I mentioned, Amsterdam finds very important to be a center of sharing city, like uh, having these platforms like Uber, Airbnb. And Airbnb is very unique in Amsterdam because we have already legislative frame. We let house owners officially rent their house out if you pay um, a, a tourist fee or tourist tax on it. Um, Amsterdam is very proud to be a center of these sharing platforms. Uh, the other trend I would like to mention to you, it's very important to define the context of the city, the electric vehicles and the um, alternative fuel. Um, Amsterdam has um, the ambition to have uh, 4,000 vehicles by 2015 to be um, electric charged, but also the bicycles are really uh, substantially raising and we try to stimulate it as much as possible to and the city is analyzing the electric charging points where we should uh, set up new electric charging points. And this, uh, the last trend I would like to mention is um, cyclists. We try to give preference to cyclists beyond cars. We, of course, would like to see Amsterdam, the historic center, almost car free. It's a very ambitious uh, project, but we try to create projects like a uh, cyclist green corridor. It means that cyclists will get the preference beyond the cars if their queue is longer. So we will install responsive traffic lights in Amsterdam to ease up the congestion. As I explained you, Amsterdam is very much experimenting also with uh, drones. We get many questions, uh, how to use these new tools, what are their, how can we permit them to fly around, uh, what are the limitations. We use lots of new sensors um, in the city to guide tourists uh, to have historical uh, explanations. And we also would like to use much more augmented reality when you have a tourist guide in the city. So all these technology and all these citizen requirements are creating for us a complex, very complex situation as decision makers. I call it transformative city complex, which can be also a bit of a headache for many policymakers, because we have questions like how can we be agile and responsive as, as a city governance? How about how can we also answer the citizen needs who wants to contribute to the city, who want to be included? Um, um, but also, how can we capture on the most novel technological solutions? Um, we also have to stay very cost uh, effective. Amsterdam has to save up 60 million uh, euros in this year, just on the city governance level. Um, also, a very important question for decision makers, how can we cut the silos between the separate city divisions? Um, and how can we incubate innovation that is actually more um, uh, transversal? Um, but to me, the most important questions I'm facing daily is how to anticipate to future trends uh, that are actually cannot be addressed by the tradition, traditional structure of city halls, like social department, ICT department. So that created us a really big challenge in the last years. And our answer from City of Amsterdam was to launch the CTO office, the Chief Technology Office, in 2014. 
um, which is very unique because we are just um, reporting to the highest level of uh, policymaker, that's the general secretary. Um, and our mission is to improve the quality of life and international com uh, um, competitivity, so to try to compete with other cities and also to respond to technological challenges. That is our mission. And uh, so, as I mentioned, we just exist nearly one year. We have like uh, currently 10 employees, rapidly growing. We actually apply the whole desking methodology. So we are flying, we are more like a flying brigade in the city hall. Um, and we really uh, evangelize the citywide innovation. So we don't go to one department and try to work there, but we try to work uh, in different departments, talk to many city decision makers, but also to enterprises and research institutions. Uh, so I'm, as I already mentioned, we are very silo free. Uh, we try to be very responsive to city needs uh, because we analyze, so what would you like to incub uh, innovate, but you can't push it forward. And we, we conduct interviews with the um, policymakers, and this is how we um, uh, start up with projects. So we actually mediate new experimental approaches that we see maybe in the uh, industries or enterprises, and we try to inject this new approach to the city hall. Uh, try to rejuvenate the city uh, organization. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're not just applying IT solution, it's also very much societal, and um, we try to give an answer to complex urban challenges. And we try to use data, data analytics, big data, uh, and inclusive policy making, so participatory policy making. This is my team. You see Gerba, so you see. Uh, so the guy with the microphone, he's the manager, he's the chief technology um, officer, Ger Baron. And we are a very young team. We have very diverse uh, capacities um, uh, from the policymaker till the urban designer, um, and till the data analytics. So I'm, I think it's a very nice uh, team setup. Uh, this, so the question is, who do we report to? As I mentioned, we are really reporting just directly to the executive board of the city of Amsterdam. And that's very nice because it gives us also the liberty and operational freedom to innovate a lot. Um, this is the CTO uh, office organization. Uh, in the outer circle, these are the employees. And um, the white people are the city workers, the, you know, so these are the department workers. And this is how we try to actually um, uh, activate people who are working in the department but cannot foresee the chances or cannot push innovation forward. And we try to bring innovation from outside inside, uh, from what we see in the companies and uh, and um, in, in different cities, we try to um, mitigate and try to connect it to the city of Amsterdam. And you can see some major topics like data, social innovation, uh, um, governmental service design. Um, so these are the topics that keeps us busy daily. What we bring is actually knowledge about open data, digital infrastructure, and uh, innovative procurement. We try to cut up really big um, um, procurements to smaller ones, and we try to work with open calls. And how we work is a very lean methodology, and we try to set up labs, participatory labs, how to redesign a policy, like a, how to park your bike, a bike. And we also evangelize very much the service design concept. So try, we try to think from the perspective of citizens, which is quite unique within a top-down city hall. And we try to work with challenges, that, like we arrange competitions when we have a policy problem. Um, so what we try to do also, we try to create um, a lot of visibility for the city office. We have a um, monthly an event where we invite approximately 30 people that are coming also from enterprises, but also from um, resource institutions. We call it Tour de Ville, and we invite um, very interesting speakers from industry or, or uh, from the city hall, just to um, actually train people what is innovation in Amsterdam. And that creates lots of visibility for our activities. Um, very important to mention that we don't operate um, separately. CTO office is an integral part of this innovation ecosystem, which is existing of universities, but the startup accelerators, um, Amsterdam Economic Board, Smart City, 
uh, PACO is the survivor, is the kind of institution that is, is uh, launching a lot of public debates. Um, so that really makes us so um, agile and that helps us to have to nourish knowledge. Just uh, my last point in my presentation, I would like to mention you some of the examples what we are doing in a city office and iconic projects. Um, um, we actually educate coding in a very early age, like um, starting from really from eight. So there are many new projects in Amsterdam uh, that I is actually mentioning in uh, secondary school, how important it is for children to expose them to gaming and to learn them how to code. But we also focus very much on uh, separately from the digitalization to sustainability, startup acceleration and internal capacity building within the city hall, training policymakers to use other tools uh, to uh, make policy and decisions. Uh, just recently, I was coordinating a project then, uh, about uh, Lighthouse. It means energy and CO2 reduction uh, in a very large scale and building a very big smart grid um, for locally generated um, energy. And uh, this was for Amsterdam very important and really a large funding request from the European Commission. And we did it with Turin and with Helsinki. Uh, Next to the Lighthouse project, we also try to build up um, smart city initiatives like um, solar panels, reusing energy, smart grid, using more electric vehicles. And what is unique about this concept is that we analyze the usage of electric cars and we try to make new electric chargers just demand driven. We really would like to see where is the most um, char uh, chargers are needed in the city. Um, that's just explaining the concept um, of the lighthouse, how we try to have locally uh, generated energy between a hospital and between a, a football stadium. So that will help us really to have a large amount of CO2 reduction. Uh, and we also would like to work with smart lights that are actually very responsive for the movement of citizens in the city and just being used if the, we have a really um, measurable crowd moving around. Uh, then the iBeacon Mile project is a new project that is using new kind of sensors um, that are locally, um, that is sending actually um, uh, ge yeah, geo-based information and we would like to use it also for the European presidency that Amsterdam is going to have from next year on. And this is a kind of touristic route that you can go through. And if you have the right application, you will get uh, navigation. Uh, so what is this building famous of? Or uh, if you are interested in ships, where can you go? Or if you are interested in uh, a special architecture, what would be the best route to take? Um, so that's the iBeacon project. Um, but it's very unique that we have these small sensors that are quite inexpensive. Uh, but it's not being experimented for civic deployment like transportation culture, just being used commercially. So Amsterdam is like to be very much the hotspot of these beacons. And next to the technology, we also very much well, we are very well networked. Um, Amsterdam is really, um, um, yeah, have a very intense network with the European network of living labs. Uh, we are also in the council, but also with the Euro cities. Uh, Fireware is the open cloud, open stack open cloud of the European Commission. And this gives us a kind of intelligence that we operate, um, that we make good procurement decisions and try to capture the most yeah, cutting edge technologies that are possible. Um, we are just, there are many in initiatives in Amsterdam that is actually promoting the public-private partnership. ACTI is the uh, Amsterdam Health and Technology Institution public-private partnership also, and this is also a living lab. It's being set up um, also with the support of the city of Amsterdam. What is unique is not just about uh, health research, but it's very much about part and accelerating entrepreneurship, um, innovation and education center. So it's very much like a, a living lab together with the citizens. Um, and we also very much focusing on citizen-driven initiatives. Amsterdam has lots of bottom-up um, uh, networking organization and we try to connect them to the city hall to make better decisions. Um, just to conclude my conclusion, the, my presentation, uh, so the innovative city assets for the, uh, from CTO perspective are the open data. We really can reshape the city with open data. 
open innovation because you can set up living labs, you can work together with very multidisciplinary parties, participatory policy because I think um, it's very important to involve citizens and companies in city decision making. Then the startups are really uh, bringing such an unknown, un unforeseen power in the city. I talk to them daily that it's just really nice to see. And then if you work with open calls and not procuring and not having fendor lock-in, that can really rejuven rejuvenate the city organization. And as I mentioned, it's very important for us to be well connected to international large-scale projects that are training us to be well aware of the available technological tools and citizen participation. And uh, I'm mentioning Open Data Institute. We also work with them a lot, and Commission, and of course with the World Bank. So that's very useful for us to trigger us to be uh, smart enough. Um, hereby, I would like to finish my presentation. I thank you so much for your attention, and I hope I can answer your question. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was very, <clears throat> very in interesting, very informative. And of course, uh, in a matter of time, uh, we will take the questions and answers at the end of end of the presentations. And uh, now I would like to give floor to Gab Gabriela, and let's hear about a little bit similar type of initiative from Mexico City. Gabriela, floor is all yours. Hello, everybody from Mexico City. So I'm here to tell you about a very little lab for a very big city. Uh, Laboratorio para la Ciudad was born about two years ago, two years ago this June, so it's also quite a new project. Um, we are the experimental think tank and creative space for the Mexico City government, and we report as well directly to the mayor. So, so it's been very important as for Caitlin to actually have an overview and basically be put into into a space where you really can have uh, your say in, in things and cut across silos. We are part of a, of a growing network of government labs around the world. There's more or less about 10 of us within government. And even though we are all quite different in depending on where we're placed inside the government structure, our mandate, uh, if we look at certain subjects or create more of these conversation across silos, one of the things that we do share is an experimental ethos, as well as being able to mitigate risk for the rest of government. Because on one hand, many times we ask government to be innovative and to have uh, spaces for great ideas. But at the, on the other end, as citizens, we usually expect for governments to be very solid and sure-footed. And that is where labs uh, internationally come in. Possibly the thing that makes us most different to the others is Mexico City. Mexico City is 22 million people in the metropo like the metropolitan area. 50% of our population is under age 26. So as you can imagine, it's a very young city. It's the eighth largest city economy in the world. And at the same time, we have one of the, the lowest minimum wages in the whole of Latin America. So it's also a city of contrasts. Um, we have the world's number one, number two billionaire, depending, depending when you count. Uh, but we also have 50% uh, of our population living from informal economy. So this actually makes it a very interesting, very complex space to work in, uh, just because of the diversity of the population of the city. So this is my team. Uh, my team is composed of everything from artists, designers, filmmakers, historians, journalists, artificial intelligence experts, urban geographers, uh, international relationships, a, a few policy wonks, uh, so it's actually a quite a motley crew, and as I've said many times before, we're we are actually the the first experiment of the lab is the composition of the team, as well as having people that had no prior experience of government suddenly jump into in into the bureaucracy and report directly to the mayor. We have two main focuses. Uh, one of them is civic innovation, which basically means how can we start reinventing and reimagining the way the government and civil society come together and collaborate and really start changing the, our, our paradigm from government to governance, bringing in every time more citizen voices uh, into, into the way the government works. And the other one is urban creativity, which is basically thinking about how the city itself could be this traveling surface for ideas and how the city itself should be the one that proposes this creative ethos beyond the walls of institutions and, and, and such. Um, so this is our space. One of the things that we decided early on was that if we were going to be getting into open government, 
that we should be the first ones to actually embody uh, everything that we think about making government more porous and more open to citizens' ideas. So one of the things that we've done in our, in our rooftop space is uh, create a little territory in government that is not only about services and complaints, but also about ideas and debates and uh, the, this place to encounter government officials under different circumstances. So there we organize debates, we organize forums, workshops, and a whole other series of things. We also have a residency program and have had some amazing people coming in uh, through the lab on a rooftop, such as Perry Chen, who's the co-founder of Kickstarter, who spent a month with us in Mexico City and, and both giving talks, but also with informal uh, meetings with people from the Mexico City innovation ecosystem, which was incredibly interesting. So he's just one of many people that we've been working with. Um, this is what the lab looks like in, from the inside. It's, it's become a very young crowd, very interested in, in city making and, and policy on government. And it's amazing to see how when you open up the, the doors of government, people just flock in. At the same time, we've also done more specialized workshops, trying to bring in um, just like this interest for newer technologies, such as aggregate printing and to rethink manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. And we also host conferences outside of our space. Usually they fill up in about three days. So this is this was a, a conference on walkable city that had about 600 people signed up, uh, completely full house. So it's very interesting for us to see that city cities and governments can actually become sexy and can become interesting to a whole series of people. Um, we not only work without government, but are also trying to instill good practices within. So uh, in terms of our open city agenda, open government, We've also hosted more than 600 uh, different workshops and events and uh, just like training in general. No, I'm sorry. About 600 people have come in through our workshops and trainings and events from government. And we're basically trying to instill the idea of these change makers within government. So we've created quite a few networks, um, a data team, for a specialized data team, for example, with the Ministry of Finance and then a... Uh, uh, network of innovators within government and then just like bringing together the IT people for the first time. And then the second part that we do is really try to mix up government and civil society in different ways uh, just to get our hands dirty together and so civil society can notice what comp complex uh, equations go on without government as well as government can notice that there's a lot of talent to be tapped into in civil society. So we have the great fortune of being able to do uh, a very wide range of things. Uh, we also have really enjoyed exploring uh, public space. So this is actually a, a project that's called Agora Mobile that was done by an artist called Pedro Reyes on the left. We were passing, uh, Mexico City government was passing a slightly controversial mobility law. And uh, on the left hand, you see people that were for it and on the right pe hand, people that were against it. So it was just like very interesting hosting like these public debates in, in public space and uh, knowing that government uh, should actually also go into the streets of the city to find the people. So one of our big thoughts is how can we think about the city itself as a public good? And how can we think about government as a detonator and catalyzer of uh, citizen talent? We work through what we call experiments. So in these two years, we've done about 60 of them, probably, at very different scales. And uh, what has been fun because of the composition of my team is that we do some slightly outlandish, very tiny urban interventions. Like this is, for example, uh, an uh, urban artifact done with a couple of amazing Mexican artists. And we were trying to gather people around a conversation of how the cityscape had changed in the neighborhood. And it's been interesting seeing how new urban forms can actually influence the way that people come and gather around um, uh, wanting to know more about government projects and proposals. And at the same time, we have uh, under our belt the, the whole open government agenda. So we were the ones to put together an, a working team composed of the people that had attributions but were not necessarily sitting at the same table and speaking to each other. And this has been everything from really understanding that this is also a cultural shift and administrative shift and a legal shift, and just like creating a wide ranging strategy from here to the next four years. Um, it has to do with, so we've been defining uh, basically open government as not only accountability and transparency, but also participation, collaboration, 
and innovation plus new uses of technology. So basically, this has meant thinking about systemic change. And I won't get a, a very deep into this because it's a very long conversation. But it has, this has gone from tiny interventions. But it's also we just passed the first, I, we believe, open city law in the world, which is also interesting because it's a dynamic law which will update itself continuously. And so for the first time in Mexico City, we have a guaranteed right for citizens that they have to be and should be part of the design of public policy, not only of a representative democracy, but actually a participatory democracy. And so this also obliges the government to continuously experiment with new ways and new forms and new technologies of bringing in more citizen voices into the conversation. We also have a whole series of things about open source and you know, just like open platforms and all of these things embedded. And we also put human rights right up there um, in in terms of open government, which is also quite quite new in in terms of how it's been thought about worldwide. Um, we also create participatory platforms, also incubating ideas with um, from citizens with the help of other ministries. So we've put out quite a few digital platforms doing exactly that. Some of them very themed, and some of them a lot more open. And then we also have some longer term projects, such as Code for Mexico City where we partnered with Code for America and brought in uh, six young programmers plus a whole series of volunteers from different disciplines and put them to work with different ministries for nine months. And we're, we're rolling out the, f the first applications in a couple of months and, and have amazing projects in hand. So it was very interesting. Uh, we've also did an experimental data lab. Uh, which is basically a platform that then inspired the official data platform for the Mexico City government. And it's been very interesting to see the hunger that there is for data. Uh, just our, uh, the, uh, the API that we created for, for transport had more than 4 million consultations in the, first, in the first three months. So as you can imagine, it's actually been, there's a lot of hung people out there hungry for data. And this is, to be honest, a conversation that we need to strengthen and even more so and become very strategic in the way that a government that has 300,000 employees actually starts opening up the data. So we also created, uh, with other ministries, a, a interoperable backend, which will audit, automatize a lot of the data gathering from the different ministries and should be up and running by the, the end of this year. Uh, part of the use of data is creating instantaneous communities around them. So we hosted uh, the first data festival in Mexico City. By day four, we had 400 people signed up and 500 and 500 people signed up and 200 people on the waiting list. We just hosted the second uh, data fest, which is called Hack CDMX. And once again, we had 1,027 people signed up and about 600 people showing up uh, for 48 hours of continuous hacking and programming and workshops and talks and things. So so it's been very interesting to see also how we can layer that with people from government. We had a hundred mentors during these events that came from government to sit with the with the with the young and not so young programmers and explain the data sets and such. Um, we are now in the first edition there was nothing that was truly implementable and that was something that we wanted to change in terms of objectives for this year. So right now the winner of uh, of our data festival is working with the minister that you see there, his back towards the camera, of, uh, of uh, public security. And they've created a very interesting app to basically get rid of uh, police, transit police corruption, and for policemen to be able to monitor much better how citizens are rating their, their, their work and also take action. So this is actually going to be a citizen-led app, but it's also going to be officially incorporated into Mi Policia, which is an app that was created that you can automatically uh, reach the closest police if you have an emergency wherever you are in the city. We've also had uh, been very interested in bringing children into the conversation. So one of the first things that we've done was partner up with UN Habitat as well as Aldea Digital and uh, Minecraft. And so we had 7,500 kids coming in through a tent in the Socalo, which is our main square, to actually recreate digitally the square that is right in front of our office. So that's Tlaxcuaque, and up there you can see our rooftop on the left side. Uh, so it's, been, it's also been very interesting for us to start thinking how we can start at a younger age. And for this year, we're actually partnering with the Ministry of uh, Education, and we'll be working with public schools and some of the most... Um, 
just like poverty ridden areas of the city and really thinking about new type of curricula and ways of thinking about citizenship from an early age on where they feel that they have agency in the way that the, the city is created. We, we, we were also uh, fortunate enough to have won the Audi Urban Future Award for a data doning program that we have and basically a city operating iOS competing against the cities of Berlin, Seoul and Boston. So this is the first time that the prize stays in Latin America, which is a innovation and mobility prize, arguably one of the most important ones out there. And uh, it was great because it's also the first time the government is part of the winning team. So I'm very proud of that as well. And this is this is our a team that was composed both of a uh, Jose Castillo, an architect, as well as Carlos Gershenson, who's a uh, a physicist and uh, does a lot of analytics and uh, modeling around traffic flows and such. Um, so that's her data donning pro project. And one of the last ones that we we're doing right now, uh, talking about the sharing city, sharing economy is we are going to be hosting the first digital debate uh, of, for Mexico City. The Uber coming into the city has been incredibly controversial because we have 140,000 taxi drivers here. And, uh, and obviously, we need to not only deal with innovation issues, but also social issues in a place that is as socially complex and, and diverse as our, as our city is. So it's been very interesting to see how we can activate a law that was passed three weeks ago and start playing with different platforms uh, and ways of bringing in citizen voices. We're also partnering with the MIT Media Lab and are putting out a new platform to be commented uh, by citizens at large that has to do with recommendations that will come out not only of the debates, but the tables that we're creating with experts in different fields, as well as the taxi drivers, the, the Ubers and the Cabify's and everything. So basically, this, this is a very quick sweep of the type of projects that we're working on. Uh, governance and participatory projects in a city this size is quite a challenge. So this, I think, is just like the very beginning of a conversation that is happening worldwide. And in a certain sense, I'm incredibly happy that Mexico City has decided also to create like this layer of creative bureaucrats, if you will, that are allowed to, to just like go forth and bring in different experiments and have buy-in from very high up to basically say, okay, like we are as the world is right now trying to define what this means. What does it mean to bring in more voices into public policy? And uh, so we need to start experimenting and taking the lead in and knowing that some of them will work, some of them will not. But this is still a very open ended conversation that we're very happy uh, to be part of. And so just to end, that is possibly what we're what we're looking into is if our ideas of cities has changed and it's not only the practical city that, that we want nowadays and the efficient city, how can government become a catalyzer and how can government also be a creative agent really tapping into the talent that exists in, in civil society? Um, and that's, that's about it. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you. Excellent presentation. A lot of food for thought also for the bank and, and for the community participating in, in this webinar. Uh, before going to the question, let me just reflect a little bit. And, and I find it quite interesting that at the same time, we have two cities, both which are very much forward looking, but located in, in different parts of the world. And yet uh, similar type of initiatives similar type of even administrative structures, you know, both reporting to the mayors directly, but at the same time having a very holistic approach, covering really to the different groups and, and the different stakeholders and starting from the kids. Uh, let me ask you both of the question that how difficult it is to get started with this kind of initiative and, and what is the role of the top management in order to in order to allow this type of new initiatives to grow within the city structure. If I can start with Katalin. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in Amsterdam um, the case is that they see us as an inspirational source. Uh, we are more like, um, so if it's about open data or new technology, I noticed that um, um, some managers are noticing that they're growing out of their roles. Uh, 
And it's not meant as a kind of um, defense, it's not meant as a kind of um, attack, but more like they recognize that the world is changing so hard and we are so transformative. And these young guys, this flying brigade, they know quite a lot. So why don't we cooperate with them? They help us also our job and um, they help us to procure better. So they become more like, um, let's try to work with them. And uh, because we can make nice uh, talks or presentations, um, we understand technology. Um, so it's more like they see us not as a threatening, but as a kind of enrichment of knowledge. And this is also how we position ourselves. We very consciously arrange lots of meetings with the kind of um, old type of management, and we really network with them a lot. We take them to a boat trip, we take them to um, drink with them, to eat with them. So it's more like... Um, we really try to involve um, ourselves with um, management very consciously. And we try to explain them um, what is the new technology about and what would we do differently. But we are never uh, really a kind of um, uh, threatening, but more like um, it's a viable, better option for them. And I think this helps us a lot uh, to see, they see us more like as a very logical extension of the city uh, policy or management because, yeah, we have a kind of uh, attitude of young, uh, agile, we cut through the rules a little bit, but not like uh, re risking the public organization. I don't know if it's answering your question. Yes, uh, yes, very much so. Uh, Gabriela, could I ask you that? How big role in order to kickstart initiative like this is the top management in, in the city? What's the role of the mayor and, uh, and other departments, traditional departments in city government? How do you partner and play with them? So uh, the role of the mayor has been fundamental. The, the lab would not exist if it had, this has not been the decision of the, the mayor himself. And at the same time, we would not have the operating freedom that we do if we didn't have his blessing and his support. Because uh, it, as you can imagine, in a city that has 300,000 bureaucrats, it's uh, many times incredibly siloed. And it's also, there's a lot of hierarchies to it. Like the ministers, if you take into account that the Minister of Mobility oversees 22 million people, or just our subway has 5 million people getting on it every day, this is actually the size of countries, right? So they, and Mexico City is definitely the seat of power here. Um, so basically what the, what the support of the mayor has done has been to open up the doors of the very highest levels of government. And at the beginning, I, I have the feeling that they opened the doors because of this, because, you know, if the mayor is sending over his, his, uh, his lab team, so obviously you're going you're gonna to host a meeting and everything, but at the same time, they have such busy schedules. But to be honest, part of these two years of work has become learning how to become relevant to them as well. How do we have this social relevance, but also this uh, governmental relevance, if you will, and just as Cart Caitlin was saying, where they see it as an asset, that there's a lab that exists, that can mitigate risks, that they can partner with, that can bring in younger, more contemporary voices uh, into the conversations as well. Let me continue a little bit on this one because obviously it's a groundbreaking work what you are doing and uh, and and uh, so my question maybe it is that do you also spill over on a metropolitan level and uh, and how do you see yourself within uh, within the national national landscape are you experiment that can be actually scaled up um so, um, in terms of... Um, so, in terms of the metropolitan level, Mexico City spilled over into its neighboring, in, into its neighboring uh, states, certainly. Um, it's still very much a siloed conversation in many ways, but at the same time, when you take into account that the Mexico City proper has nine and a half million people, but we have 5 million people coming in every day to work. So basically we have, uh, even though we don't have a metropolitan planning that is in place, especially in terms of the lab, because we're very much focused on the city, there are decisions that get made in the city that end up affecting the neighboring states as well. Uh, we've been working quite a bit with the Ministry of Mobility on different types of projects, and obviously this will also have a repercussion outside of the city. 
uh, but I'd say we're more focused on the local level. In terms of influence outside, we've had several, not only cities in Mexico, but several cities uh, around the world actually writing us and meeting up with us because they wanted to put labs in place as well. So one very interesting fact is that we brought over Rudy Borman, who used to run the open government office for the city of Buenos Aires, to advise our data portal team on certain things. And he went back and inspired by the lab, created a lab in Buenos Aires. And then Chile follows, I'm sorry, and then Rio followed suit as well. And now Chile has a lab as well on a national level that they also called us to ask for uh, pointers and advice and such. So basically we're talking about four of the most important uh, countries in Latin America in the span of two years have just like cascaded down uh, because one mayor took a risk and th that makes it easier for the other cities to up to go up to their mayors and say, hey, the, you know, Mexico City is doing this. <laughs> Why don't we go for it as well? So it, it's been very interesting to see how there's hunger for these types of spaces in, in other places. So, Catalin, how much is your your work in Amsterdam? How much is that spilling over on a national national level or other cities in Europe? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or in Holland? Um, I would say that we are quite much forerunners in the Netherlands with the city office. We have many chief, in, uh, yeah, chief information officers, but not CTOs in a sense that we are, because we are actually an innovation accelerator uh, or a kind of innovation agency within the city hall. That one doesn't exist in other cities, but we cooperate a lot uh, together uh, with other European cities, uh, of course, with the... Um, with Helsinki, with um, um, Barcelona, with London uh, especially. And uh, um, there is a network of cities, it's called Open and Agile Smart Cities, being launched um, by the Commission. And that's, I think, a very important network also for us to see um, how to accelerate if it comes to open data. What are the best uh, data publishing tools? Um, what are the best, uh, most user-friendly data portals? So that exists, but in the national field, I think we are quite much pioneering because we get also lots of support from the major, but also other policymakers. Um, and um, we do work together with the surrounding cities like Almera, that are that is very good in big data, for example, or with research institutions. I think probably Eindhoven could be mentioned as similar. But they don't have such an office as do we have, as, as like we have such a big team, like ten people who are chasing innovation and try to work like cross-cutting all the silos. So that's pretty unique. Um, and European level, I think it's getting more and more advanced. Looking a little bit uh, on more on 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 the technological side of this, I mean Amsterdam. Uh, of course, your infrastructure is very robust, and so considering this, that. And, and we are also dealing with cities that may have similar kind of uh, advantages you have. So if you think about internet connectivity, for example, uh, could you advise how cities who would be interested to create similar type of activities, but with a little bit less robust connectivity, how could they start? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a very good question, because actually business-wise, it simply doesn't pay off to have the whole city wholly connected. Uh, because it's just too expensive, the city also cannot pay, and you need to find business partners and sponsors that are enabling you to have a public-private partnership. And secondly, you have to identify um, territories uh, like where you have a very high connection and high speed needed, like film industry, advertising. Amsterdam was analyzing which are these areas, and we very deliberately moved our um, open internet infrastructure, for example, to the Wester Park, where we have uh, media, television, uh, um, forecasting, and that was very important for us to be there, um, of course, highly connected. So I think it should be a very um, uh, mindful analysis of um, where is connection needed, and um, and of course there is another approach that tourists can also address that here I would need a free Wi-Fi, and then you do more like bottom-up generation of Wi-Fi demand. That's also possible, but we did more like top-down analysis. Where are the film industries? Where is high connection needed? And we let also sponsors. Um, we work very much together with KPM. Um, the local telecom company, and we make um, negotiations like how 
could they support us for two, three years long to have a um, discounted Wi-Fi um, release? For Gabriela, and continuing a bit what Katalin also said, that you are obviously benchmark, as you mentioned, for the several cities in Latin America and in Americas by and large. Uh, and they ask you advice to establish a lab. So what are the three most important things that you are telling them when they are asking you, where should I start with my lab plans? So I, I have a feeling that uh, one of the very first things that you already touched upon is buy-in from the very, very top. I do believe that if you don't have this, you can get completely lost under the bureaucracy and size of government, uh, because usually labs, and I, I see that Caitlin's uh, space is, is more or less similar, like we're not that many people. Like usually a, a ministry here is like 500, 600 people strong with huge budgets, and we're like less than 20 people, and we have tiny budgets in comparison to government. So what you need to have and to guarantee is leverage. Um, second of all, I, I have the feeling that it's also very important to understand the cities where you're placed and what are some of the major challenges, as well as the possible spaces of inflection, because dealing with, especially when you're dealing with complex systems, and the city is definitely a complex system, and any of these subjects is a complex system in and of itself. It's more about interventions and in specific spaces that will actually help uh, propel the conversation forward. So, so I think that just like gathering knowledge in the first years of government, even though you know one of the desires is to just like go out running, it's also very interesting to see what is already there. And what we've tried to do as well is marry political will with social energy. Like what are these conversations that have not yet happened, but that are also ripe to be pushed forward? Because if not, you can spend your next six years actually trying to get something off the ground. Um, and then spend all your energy there. So how do you do this? And also, how do you, in, in our case, personalize these relationships? Like have government see that there's a lot of talent out there, as well as citizens, as I mentioned before, really start knowing and, and admitting that, the, that this thing of uh, building and managing and creating cities is actually a very, very complex thing. And... Uh, and really take that into account when proposing ideas. So, and maybe last but not least is how do you make labs into strange attractors? Because the first thing that you need to guarantee uh, your way forward is that people, talented people are intrigued and interested. And these are people within government, without government. So the question of how can you create a space that people want to belong to and be part of and find something interesting there and that more or less uh, is able to implode all the stereotypes that we have about government in general. So I think that would be more or less like the three first things. There's so many of them, but possibly those are some of the general ingredients that I put on the table. Thank you. And how important, this is a question for both of you, uh, coming in, how important are flagship initiatives like open data for example, and, and, and are these really mainstreamed within the different initiatives in a city? Well, obviously, this is the development which certainly takes place already in, in Mexico City and interoper interoperable backend with the ministries, but is open data something that you could start with and start building the ecosystem as well? Um, I would say certainly, uh, uh, yeah, open data is something that um, not just creates opportunity to better decision making in the city halls, but also can accelerate businesses. And we see that um, it also can lead to very um, bad and good procurement decisions. And what we try to do also in the open agile cities, the European network, we try to protect cities, not to buy unnecessarily expensive, too heavy infrastructure that is actually creating just fender lock in. We try to train cities how to operate, um, how to capture on the GitHub, how to reuse uh, already existing solutions. Um, 
And I think open data can create so many values. We use open data for the electric vehicles. Huh? When we need to launch a new charging point, we know exactly where is it the most needed. And because we now know it, then we also have a kind of cost reduction approach because we don't place them unnecessarily if it's not being used. So I think it helps the city very much to make a very healthy decision making. And at the end, it not just lead to uh, business acceleration, but also to cost reduction. So this is a very important flagship, but also sustainability. It's something that we cannot eliminate anymore from cities. It's getting so immense and so huge topic to be CO2 free and energy saving um, that cities have to address it um, like silo free, cross border oriented um, because it's very complex. And also like Mexico City, Gabriela mentioned the congestion in cities. Uh, it's a very tough issue. The crowd flow management, how to help the cities, if we have an event in Amsterdam, like we had the Queen's birthday a couple of weeks ago, um, like 30,000 new um, tourists are entering all of a sudden the city, and it really creates a peak um, in terms of moving through the city. So in these days, we need the kind of smart data flow analytics that helps you to go through this crowd or, or ha have your own preference that you don't want to go to the crowd. And I think open data is certainly the one infrastructure that will make us much more smarter and uh, yeah, will create a much more resilient city. Gabriela has a final final question to you before we close. Is the, the open data, of course, is a big uh, big uh, enabler in many different ways in different cities. In Mexico City, is it is your initiative mainstreamed or? Is it parallel with the other initiatives in a city? How, what is your experience on this? So when we, when we first formed the Open Government Group, one of the things that we tried to, to find were these uh, joint agendas where we thought because of forming one same working group, everybody's objectives could be strengthened. Um, so we got together with the people that already had the Open Data Portal and uh, and to be honest, they were not up to par with international standards. We had PDFs up there. They were not, you know, many of them were not mineable. They were not interoperable. Uh, there was no single standard of how to make start with the interoperability within government. So what we did was bring in a few advisors um, to actually help the team just rethink the way that we were going forward. And to be honest, they were incredibly open to new suggestions. And so what we did was create a, uh, the, the data lab, which is more of an experimental nature. Let's say it's a data farm where we first put up uh, new data sets and new APIs. And then after we find that they, they're mature enough, and as I said, we've had the fortune of having communities that are 500 people strong actually cr uh, uh, gather around like these new data sets that we just put out with, uh, with the, the data festival. And then they get a lot of feedback and then we help them better them and then after that the idea is that they get pulled into the official data portal at the same time we also help them work on the interoperable uh, back end uh, to start automatizing all of these uh, all of this gathering of data uh, the only thing is that the person that was in charge unfortunately left so right now uh, the person that is coming in is still just like getting their footing uh, in terms of what is coming and what is needed, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that we're thinking of is actually getting somebody to sponsor a prototyping and uh, a chief data officer for Mexico City. So, you know, not necessarily taking the full jump yet, but one of, we've been very lucky to have amazing funders in the Meteor and Hewlett Foundation that, as you know, are some of the most important funders in transparency. So basically, we're going to be making a pitch to see if, uh, since right now it's an experiment, if we can have outside funding, have a chief data officer, really have him help uh, both us in terms of the more experimental side, but also the government as a whole in a more formal and mainstream way actually have a data plan for the next four years. So this really becomes a conversation and this really becomes a strong muscle. And just to end that, we're also very much aware that this is not only about changes within government, but changes without. So the, the ecosystem of entrepreneurs is very active around data, but we have two things that we also think are very necessary. One of them is data-driven policy within government and building a muscle for that. 
And the second is uh, data scientists that are interested in public policy, which we don't have very much of. So basically what we're doing is partnering with three of Mexico's city's foremost universities and creating a, an excellence program between them so we can hopefully inspire them to go mainstream as well and have more and more people intrigued by what it would mean to put their skills uh, in data analysis to the use of public good and as well as just be aware of what an amazing uh, market there is for these types of new profiles in the not only in Mexico City but actually in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you, Katalin. Uh, unfortunately, we have to close now. Uh, I think this is very useful and we will continue hopefully offline and discussion, of course, with the community. Like I mentioned earlier, we recorded the presentation and we are also doing a podcast for this. So, uh, So this knowledge will be available for the audience in, in the further, further engagements. Let me just also take the opportunity that we have a next series of the webinar on Thursday next week, 4th of June. And uh, we will continue actually on topics which Gabriela already outlined in her last comment quite nicely, uh, discuss a little bit more about the ecosystem of entrepreneurs animators, orchestrators, and hubs, and how hubs, especially privately owned hubs, can act as an animators of this type of partnerships. And partnerships leads, of course, to the thoughts to the, not only to the city office, but also the university, private sector, and other actors within the ecosystem. So I hope you are all able to join us on next Thursday as well, and I thank you for your presence for the time being. Thanks for the participating and we are looking forward to see you at the next webinar on Thursday next week. Thanks.